uh, Chairman, members of the committee, uh, members of the European Parliament, thank you very much for uh, inviting me today to speak about Magnitsky sanctions. Um, I have the um, uh, experience with this issue, which goes back um, to the death and murder of Sergei Magnitsky um, on November 16, 2009. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer in Russia. He was murdered for uncovering a vast government corruption scheme, and after his murder, um, I made a vow to his memory, to his family, and to myself that I was going to go after the people who killed him and make sure they face justice. When we tried to get justice in Russia, um, that proved to be impossible because the Putin regime um, circled the wagons and made sure that everybody um, got away with impunity. And so then we said to ourselves, if we can't get justice inside of Russia, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And we looked at the crime that Sergei Magnitsky exposed, and it was a crime of money. Sergei Magnitsky exposed a $230 million uh, corruption scheme. And the people who committed that crime don't keep their money in Russia, they keep that money in the West, in London, in Paris, they keep it in New York and other places. And we came up with the idea of freezing their assets and banning their visas. And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. Um, the first countries that we went to was the United States, and we came here uh, to the European Parliament. Um, in both countries, I started this campaign in 2010. The um, uh, advocacy work that I did got traction much quicker in the United States. Um, and by the end of 2012, it went for a vote. The Magnitsky Act went for a vote, and it passed the Senate 92 to 4, and it passed the House of Representatives with 89 percent, and became a U.S. federal law on December 14, 2012. At that time, the Magnitsky Act just applied to Russia. And the reaction from Russia was extreme. Vladimir Putin was so angry, he made it his single largest foreign policy priority to try to have the Magnitsky Act repealed and to stop it from spreading. And when members of Congress saw his reaction, um, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have the reaction that he thought they would have. Instead of being intimidated, they said, wait a second, if it works on Vladimir Putin, it should work on other dictators and kleptocrats. And they came up with the Global Magnitsky Act. And the Global Magnitsky Act passed unanimously in the Senate um, in December of 2016. It became a federal law in 2016. On the same day that the um, US passed the Global Magnitsky Act, the Estonian parliament unanimously passed the Estonian Magnitsky Act, which is a global piece of legislation. Following that, Canada passed the Magnitsky Act a global piece of legislation. And then we had uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and the United Kingdom. Now, in the meantime, we had been trying and trying and trying to get the European Union to do a Magnitsky Act. And as the chairman uh, said, in 2014, um, the, the European Parliament unanimously called on the European Union to do a Magnitsky Act. And when it went to the head of the External Action Service, Federica Mogherini, in January of 2015, she rejected the proposal. She rejected a unanimous call of the European Parliament. It was followed up on several more times, and she rejected those follow-up calls as well. She said it, she didn't think it was a good idea. I was told informally um, that if I wanted to get a Magnitsky Act in Europe, I shouldn't bother at the EU, I should go to individual member states. And so I started going around to individual member states. And I got an interesting reaction, which was that um, places like Denmark and Sweden and the Netherlands said, we think it's a great idea, but it should be done at an EU level. So the EU said it should be done at a member state level, and the member states said it should be done at an EU level. <clears throat> so then we had an interesting conversation, which was in, the, in Holland, 
my allies in the parliament then said, okay, if that's what the government says, then let's hold their feet to the fire. And the parliament then put a resolution together calling on the Dutch government to do a Magnitsky Act at the EU level. And if they don't succeed in five months, then to do a national piece of legislation. The government party said, no, 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 let's not do this. But in Holland, there is a minority government and all the other parties said, yes, it passed with a majority and the government was obliged to come to the EU and do an EU Magnitsky Act. And so the Dutch government did that, except with one huge glaring omission, which is they've deleted Sergei Magnitsky's name from the EU Magnitsky Act, pretending that he never existed, which is absurd. In a world where there are six countries with Magnitsky Acts, the Dutch foreign minister is now pretending that, that Sergei Magnitsky didn't exist. And, and, and the Dutch delegation went so far as to tell people in the European Parliament, please don't mention the name Magnitsky. Well, that doesn't make any sense. In a world where we're trying to harmonize sanctions legislation to somehow have a, a piece of, of, of standalone legislation in the EU that doesn't mention the name Magnitsky makes no sense from a policy perspective. It makes no sense from a symbolic perspective. It's a gift to Vladimir Putin, and it, it, and it completely ignores the sacrifice that Sergei Magnitsky made. And so I was pleased when Lord Anderson, um, at, who is the rapporteur at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, put together a report recommending that all Council of Europe member states adopt a Magnitsky Act, and I was particularly pleased that he said in that report, that Magnitsky's name should be on it, and I was even more pleased when it passed 95 to 3. Um, I'm here today in, in, to, to encourage the Parliament and to encourage the European Union to move swiftly on putting together the EU Magnitsky Act and to not give Vladimir Putin any gifts by taking Magnitsky's name off of it. Thank you very much.